Um, this is really crazy because I was on my way up here. I somebody from where I used to I used to work with Emily at California Sunday Magazine, and as I I don't really talk about them, but their logo is gonna pop up. <laughs> so that is really such an amazing surprise. <laughs> um, okay, so let me just get started. set up really quick. Okay, yeah. All right, so. Um, yeah, so the best meaning for your message is what I'm going to be speaking about today. I had spent a large majority of my life um, in magazine publishing, and then I transitioned to tech, um, working in editorial, their editorial team in the marketing department. And then now I have a completely different life working with messaging and storytelling, but as a visual storyteller. Um, so I'm going to get started, but before I move from this slide, I do want to point out I'm going to go more into more in depth into this particular slide right here. Um, it's a distorted image from a film that I made. I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, and again, it, it's very much connected to the kind of medium that you're focusing on and the fracture. This is a fracture, and why I like to mess with um, techniques and the styles and imagery and texture. So more to come. All right. <laughs> Okay, so um, so as the publishing industry continues to evolve, we are we get caught up in the different types of like trying to keep up with the Joneses, trying to stay relevant, trying to keep our subscribers, and I, I think people get, have a tendency to get caught up in the rat race and just not don't put as much time into the messaging and the actual storytelling. They're trying to get to the next big thing. And I know I've been, I've worked at many places where that was the case and didn't really tailor and think about like, no, you really, if you're gonna work in this particular medium, why? And how you should be changing that. Um, so I'm gonna be focusing more on that. Like while I talk about like how the landscape has changed in publishing, I wanna focus on like why you should pick the particular medium you're gonna be working with. Um, so just as a little bit about me, I've worked, I worked 16 years in magazine publishing, like I said, um, pre predominantly in New York. Um, I started at the New Yorker, um, randomly, um, and I ended up staying in that little Condé Nast world for a really long time. Um, and I was at the New, York, New Yorker and Vanity Fair, like the heyday when like life is amazing. There is like money and parties and like tons of technology and access and like life is good. <laughs> um, and then, you know, a few years later, you know, I started at uh, T, the style magazine. And um, that's when things started a little bit. I think also because it was like a newsroom. So you got the hit a little bit more than just like the, fab the fabulous glossies with all the ads, even though T was like a glossy within the New York Times. Um, so we started seeing the shifts and like the layoffs and like how people were trying to pivot, like so many people were trying to learn web. And then the big thing was video, which that was like a, a piece at, that really stuck um, at the Times. I actually worked in production at the Times um, and for, for the most part of, uh, in magazine publishing, I worked in the production department. Um, so anyway, people were starting to pivot, trying to le learn their skills. And when I ended up leaving the Times, and I ended up going to the New Republic. When I left to the, go to the New Republic, the managing editor of T went to manage the video department, the, which they were gonna like fully invest in, which was amazing. You know, a researcher who left to go, she became a filmmaker, and she was work doing films in the in the in the in the film department at the Times. And um, so that I was at the New Republic, just we're all trying to hold on. Um, and then um, I ended up at California Sunday, when I, where I met Emily, which is uh, so, mm. so mind blown that she's here. Um, <laughs> and that's when um, the landscape had really changed. That was, I think, in 2015 is when I moved here. And I had never experienced layoffs in magazine publishing or anything like that. Like, I was always the one who was still floating, so I really kind of thought I was an untouchable. So, um, but like you got, but at that point you were seeing like the budget cuts are pretty much hardcore everywhere. And I got, I did end up leaving Cal Sunday. I continued, I got recruited by Slack and to work on their editorial team. And, and then, um, you know, a lot more happened in magazine publishing. Um, and I thankfully was able to make that like pivot. But um, that's a little bit about my landscape, uh, about my experience. But I just wanted to focus on, like I said, focusing on the medium and looking at as a language again, like not like not trying to be desperate. As you see the landscape changing media, 
don't get that. I don't mean desperate, but like you get a desperate feeling, you know, when you see like the layoffs coming and I to not get into that, like really look at, I look at medium, different mediums as a language. You can express different ideas in film that you can't in, a, in print or other things. Um, so, so one thing I wanted to call out was this report that the Times did, um, I think in 2017, but I think they didn't, oh yeah, uh, but they did an update in 2020. And they were saying that the, um, you know, they just did an assessment of their, of the, of the, their state in publishing and the state of publishing in the world, or reporting, I should say, journalism. And they were saying, you know, like, yeah, they're still at the top, and they did have the top um, news team and, and the top video team and graphics teams, but they, there was still so much work that needed to be done. And um, they, here's some parts that they, I wanted to call out in the report. They were saying, yeah, despite, despite the Times having an unparalleled reputation for excellence in visual journalism, there's not enough um, in our reports that use digital storytelling tools that allow for richer, more engaging journalism. Too much of our daily reports um, are dominated by a string of text. And the, um, to solve the problem, we need to expand the number of visual experts who work with the Times and expand the number who are in our leadership, who are in leadership roles. Which again, like this is like a very thoughtful way of looking at this um, problem. And I do, because of my, medium is primarily video. I think I'm going to be speaking a little bit more about video than other mediums um, that you can work, work at in terms of options. But anyway, um, he's pointing out the problem and and the Times is a very thoughtful organization. So of course they did it mindfully, but I'm glad I, I was just really interested to see. I was really excited to actually see this report and talking about how they're examining the visual landscape. But then, uh, yeah. so uh, let me just, because I don't want to go too long. Ah. Okay. So like I said, the Times, they had that really robust, robust video department. It was really crazy. Like I told you, people were abandoning ship at the at T Magazine, working in video. Like, it was blowing up. But I, I didn't really, at that point, like, even though, because I was also in production, so I wasn't an editor or anything, so I was on the periphery. But it wasn't until I got to the New Republic, where there was a tiny um, art team. The, I was the only, I think, production, oh, no, there were two production people. I was the director. And it was a tiny art team, and he was really, his name is Dirk Barnett, and I'm not sure if you know him, <laughs> but he was, he was incredible. He made me feel part of the art team, so I got to see everything very up close. And it wasn't until I started working there when I got to see when you really are using these different mediums, like look, looking at them specifically, how you can amplify your voice using that medium and not just having it, just like throwing darts at a, like at a wall, like, or throwing, that's not darts at the wall, spaghetti or something, I don't know. <laughs> not like randomly like picking things, just hoping it's going to stick. And it was wonderful. They worked with Lindsay Adario um, on a piece called Mortal Beloved. I went on the website, I was trying to find the video. This was like a, this was in 20, yeah, April 2013. The video and like most of the images are no longer there, likely because of our, because of rights issues. But it was incredible because she's a photojournalist and, um, the, her partnership with the editor and the art department was just masterful in terms of storytelling. Um, I, I, that's and I, like I said, I, maybe because it was my proximity to the art, to the team, but like just even at the times, like I had seen things, but this is the first one that really hit me. I'm like, okay, you really have to focus your content on what you're trying to show. So we did have a print story, a print photo essay in the magazine, but then there was this incredible raw video footage that was on the website. Um, so other things I w wanted to call out um, before I start go going more into like the stuff I did at Slack, which was a lot more in depth. I wanted to call out like other like when you're looking at other mediums, um, like how it could work for you. The thing like some unexpected things, books, um, Vanity Fair. They they, pr they produce like several books. Um, when I first started there, uh, I was I was a little surprised. Like one of my first things was this big book project. But I now quickly realize that books, as, as, as a, 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 books are an incredible medium for you to work with, especially if you have a legacy, like a place like Vanity Fair. You don't even have to be like a hundred year old institution. Um, let's see, uh, like I worked at this art gallery um, and they had like their first, they had like the, uh, yeah, a book about their first 50 exhibitions. And it was just a wonderful way to work with your archive. And that's like a get, great way to pivot and show your legacy and your space, your value in a certain industry, you know, like, and so like, I'm obsessed with archives as I work with archives in general. So 
I just thought that this was just like a great example of like using a particular medium for a very specific reason to show your mastery and your legacy at imprint in an industry. Um, and again, like a very storied institution like Vanity Fair, of course, they're going to have that kind of legacy and financing to produce something like that. I mean, they worked with Viking and Three Rivers Press for these two. But then like a smaller organization, you know, they self-published this. I forgot you know, who did this. And it's like, it's absolutely gorgeous. So again, like this just, again, focusing on a particular medium, like this is like focusing on like the archival nature and your legacy. So I'm going to focus a lot now on Slack. Um, I, like I said, I worked at Slack. I was recruited when I was at Cal Sunday to go work on their editorial team. I was their managing editor. Um, and it was, I was working in the marketing team for editorial as branding. So it wasn't like the sales, like talking about product more so at the early days of Slack. It was so much fun. <laughs> um, I think that's why Slack blew up because it was just like I, they even, weren't even doing advertising. It was like totally just word of mouth. And it was just like a really fun place to work, a fun place to be. I started my first project there was to um, work on the, their podcast called Work in Progress. And um, they we had a website, we had a podcast and that we kept talking from day one about doing a print publication, which I'm going to get to that in a minute. But um, the first thing was the podcast. Um, we worked with a branding, um, uh, was like a branded podcast company. There were former like CBC radio people who had who were trying to now work with corporations who wanted to do podcasts because that's when they were super trendy. This is in 2016, and they had a very NPR feel. Their first one was called Slack Variety Pack, and this one, um, Work in Progress, had a very NPR like feel, very serious stories, but sometimes very like light stories as well. Um, it was also on Sirius XM, but. How, what we did to kind of tailor it a little bit more and do a deep dive and like focus on like working with different mediums is that we also took that podcast and the stories and we created a deep dive on our website. Um, I went on the website recently, like this week, and they took all of that stuff down. Slack is very different. <laughs> all the fun stuff is gone. But um, <laughs> but uh, we had all these incredible uh, stories. Like we, because Slack at that time, like I said they were poaching people from different um, publications. And um, so it was a lot of editors, somebody from Rolling Stone, a bunch of different places were there, uh, people from different places were there. So we had these deep dive articles, tons of photos, like very well researched pieces on the website. We can learn more about the, the, like the five minute story, or five to 10 minute story you heard on the radio. It was very much like this American life was the, like on the podcast. Anyway, so I can't show you examples like that, but what it, I can show you a little bit we kind of modeled our podcast and how they did their um, cross media with um, on 99% Invisible. Um, again, it's a very research-based um, show on NPR, uh, hosted by Roman Mars. But on their website, though, they had serious deep dives. And so, like we, so we were working all these with these different mediums, but learning how to very carefully craft and not just a gimmick. Okay, like okay, so now we're just gonna copy the audio and put it on the website and like not have people not be able to really want not have a reason for people to go to the website and drive traffic to the website which would ultimately hopefully get a customer eventually maybe maybe not but still like, we, we were really trying to find reasons to drive people to the website and also we all had worked in editorial and that's the kind of stuff we wanted to do like we didn't care about anything else this is the kind of work we wanted to do and it was awesome and so we had we hired, like, I, it was my decision to hire all these professional illustrators who worked in editorial, and we had a variety of stories. Um, we did a story on an ex-former, uh, uh, somebody who escaped slavery and launched the first taxi service in Toronto. Um, I'm forgetting the, this is Asia Aquarius story. I'm forgetting the name of the guy in the store, but he had launched some pot, what was it, like a medical marijuana company before, like it is what the world is today. Um, Russ and Daughters, we did a story on Russ and Daughters. And then we did this really incredible story. Um, looking back to the future, there was a story of a of a woman um, whose family uh, she was like, I think part of the Dreamer program, but like her family, they had immigration. There's an immigration issue with her parents, and we had a story. We had a clip of Trump talking about um, that the, the policy, and this is when it came to like, okay, I remember I'm at a tech company. <laughs> this is not editorial. We had to cut it because we didn't want to upset our um, more conservative customers, and so that kind of broke my heart. But like again, we were, you know, it was just cool to see that we were 
still like showing like we were very much in tune doing that, like a deep dive in our content and many different forms also like really quickly we did have these uh, it was we'd hardly ever mention slack but we did to get, make fun mentioning slack we would do these like customer stories like the quirky customers so we would be like oh this episode you know somebody from this this group from the fighting unicorns you know would do a little message or whatever so we were just finding cool little ways to like spice things up and to have people listen to our product um so i just want to kind of go down because i'm just looking at the time i'm not going to go over um so for also in the and while i was there we did uh channels magazine which is a bespoke magazine at that time a lot of publishing or a lot of tech companies were starting to do different magazines um uh yeah we're doing magazines ours was called uh channels and the issue was the way we work again it was like the podcast and the website at that time it was more about focusing on people's work people's work how they work trying to act like we cared about them and what they were doing <laughs> So, um, and I fought so hard because Casper had a, um, Casper, you know, the mattress company, they had a magazine um, and I, I was obsessed with it because they never mentioned the, the, the company and I was like begging. I'm like, no, we can't, we can't do it. So, but they did, we did end up having to do, where is that? We did, they did, um, we, they did have like a couple, like I think like maybe six pages of how to use Slack kind of stories or like a customer story profile, like a NASA story in Slack and things like that. But the reason we wanted to do this magazine, again, it's like picking the medium for your message is that this, we're planning a conference. We wanted a nice giveaway. We'd been talking about this from day one. This was the perfect excuse. Finally, like I had like the pitch ready for years. <laughs> like, like this is it, Trina, you're gonna get okay if you pitch it for this. And um and it happened and we we did it and it was, like I said it was a bespoke feel magazine so it was, like the quality of paper was like was excellent like everything was top notch, um, the design again we hired like serious designers um, from the editorial world I mean serious artists I mean from the editorial world it was organized just like a traditional ma magazine um, it was it was lovely it was an incredible experience and here are some of the models that that the other corporate bespoke print publications Wooly was Casper's. Airbnb mag, um, which actually it was started out as pineapple and then Airbnb mag, and I think you, you could have actually bought it in some newsstands, but it was also given free to people who were Airbnb hosts. And then Uber had vehicle, which I thought was really cool. Like I bonded with the guy who started that. We were gonna try to start doing like get-togethers with other companies doing this, but we both both of our projects got killed. <laughs> Um, so again, like first Slack, all of that kind of stuff ended because of the ROI. And again, like that's when I kind of have to take myself out of it. Like, oh, I love doing the editorial stuff. This is amazing. But is this the right medium for, for a tech company? You know, when you have to, to you're beholden to like stockholders who just want like, the, I remember the new best vice president came in from uh, um, Salesforce. And I remember the meeting, I was like talking about all the fun projects and I wanted the podcast to come back in the magazine. And she just looked like, but there's no ROI on this. I was like, oh God, my job is over. And it was, it was like, because <laughs> I did all the fun stuff. So, um, yeah, so, so, and yeah, Salesforce is very serious. Um, so, so but one thing when you're doing these, so, so yeah, so again, like very, pay very close attention to the, to when you're creating, when you're picking a medium to who your actual audience is and the message you're trying to get out. Like I said, it was a beautiful idea, but like, Long term, it was it's not sustainable. It was a cool one thing to do, got some attention, but that's about it. One thing, um, if you another thing, it's, oh, I can't even talk. Other storytelling techniques, I've um, really tried to think outside the box when we did this idea. Like we were trying to think of like fun little things to kind of make it a little stronger or make it um, uh, make it more fun. And so we just bought these old like newspaper uh, stand or boxes, you know, whatever for the conference. Um, just have a, like a to bring the tactile experience to a new level really quick i'm gonna go through my i have a like 40 seconds it's gonna be super fast i did the moth and um i pitched a story because i was like obsessed with my family history so like i was able to um i i learned like how to really get the like, craft my story like why people this is if you're this is about I'm talking the, about this right now just because of like picking your medium and like crafting a story so like when you're picking a medium you got to figure out like why should I do this and why are people going to care about it and like really think about it very carefully as you're crafting. Um, 
And so I was doing that, like figure out really what it's about. You know, it was a universal theme. It was a migration story focused on identity and, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm trying to think of some other things. And oh, and so then I do some visual storytelling. And so like, again, a different medium, I work with different mediums to tell my stories because each thing is a different language. When I, um, when I do the video, I like to work a lot with Super 8 because of texture. And I know I could only, and I think it was a lot of conversation with the past and archives in that way and not being able to fully see the past. So that's why I like to work with Super 8. But then like if I want to have somebody be able to feel, um, you know, because I work with like handmade paper, made of raw cotton mm -hmm. and all these other materials and stuff to tell stories of my family's enslavement, but also an act of reclamation that I might make my own paper and like have something more tactile. So anyway, I'm going to stop because I'm not going over. I'm not going to be that person. But um, yeah, so it was good to be here and thank you. <laughs>